Awesome. Thank you. Um, I assume we have Father Brad already on. Yes. As well. Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, oh, wonderful. Yeah. So this is, um, I, I don't know if I've ever introduced somebody actually, uh, but uh, I'm so glad that um, to have Father Brad with us today. Um, this is actually something that John was thinking to start, I, I believe, um, with doing the Zoom series of inviting some of our Dominican priests to um, come and have a discussion with us. And, and today, um, you know, the, well, the, the chapter has been really focused on, on truth, on, on veritas, and also the virtues. And like what, um, especially through our, our radio ministry of, of um, what, what it looks like to stand up to the truth and what kind of truths we, um, we may, may be standing up for. And so um, Father Brad um, graciously uh, agreed to join us um, to, to discuss for about half hour or so about, um, about truth and the ways we, we may stand up for for the truth. And uh, with that, I don't want to take up any more time. Um, Father, Father Brad, if uh, I'll let you take it from there. Sure, absolutely. Um, it's wonderful uh, to be here with you guys. Thank you for the invitation. First of all, um, I heard, uh, yeah, a, a few months ago, uh, I was contacted and, and this, this was just the time that I could make it. I was supposed to, I used to come in June. It's just unfortunately, this summer was, was very busy for me. And I was told that you were meditating on basically living truth in our world today, living, living the charism of Veritas in the world. So being lovers of Veritas, being Dominicans, true Dominicans. So having as kind of a centerpiece of our spirituality, uh, Veritas, love of truth, but then actually learning how to live that in the world and reflecting on that. And so that's what I would like to do here for at least a few minutes. And then I can, before, before kind of the end of an hour, I can open it up maybe for some questions if you'd like. Um, first, let us uh, please begin in with a prayer. Let's start in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you for the gift of our time together. Thank you for the gift of our group and the privilege and opportunity to meditate more and more on your truth. Open our minds to be receptive to all of your blessings. Most of all, open our hearts so we can be docile to your will. We ask all this through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Okay. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us pray for in now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Great. Thank you, guys. And um, the Zoom format, <laughs> just to give you guys uh, just a heads up right ahead, the Zoom format is never ideal for these type of things. Um, I think it would be best if everybody else, at least for the next half hour, while, while you're listening to this talking head right here, for the next half hour, just mute yourself. Do, do the best to mute so that we can make sure you don't, we, there's no uh, background noise, first of all, but also to make sure there's no echo. Um, if, and I'm hearing a lot, of, a lot of beeps too, which is good. It means people would just go ahead and mute yourself, which would just be very helpful to keep things flowing. So thank you very much. So Okay, living the truth in the world, living the truth in our daily lives. Uh, why is this important? And tips, tips on how to do it's a, uh, how to do it in the world. First, let's begin where we always begin with a reading from sacred scripture, a reading from the gospel according to John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, 
that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so for Dominicans, why is truth our motto? The, the motto of Veritas. Some people think that this is even almost a, just such a, such a broad, kind of an abstract, universal motto, Veritas, that it provides us virtually no guidance in life because nobody would have a motto of falsehood, of course, but we have the motto of Veritas. What does this mean? Why is this important? Now, I'd like to start with a reflection that I have, uh, that has been helpful for me, actually, as to why is truth important, particularly for Christians and particularly for Catholics, because we say that we belong to the Catholic faith, and as Dominicans, we preach and defend the truth of the Catholic faith. Okay, let me give you an example, an illustration of why Veritas is so important. When I was about six years old, five, six years old, I used to believe that Santa Claus brought me presents every Christmas day. So I would wake up in the morning on Christmas day and Santa Claus would bring me presents. Now, sometime around uh, the age of eight or nine, I stopped believing in that. But Christmas has never really been the same since I stopped believing that. It hasn't really been quite as, quite as exciting, quite as magical. I can remember a time when I was, when I was five or six that believing in Santa Claus gave me a sense of joy that I can only remember now when looking back of nostalgia, the joy of Christmas times. It gave me a sense of joy, first of all. It also, too, gave me a sense of excitement around Christmas. It was exciting. It gave me a sense. It was, it was like, this was a reason to be alive. It was like a sense of, like, oh, my gosh. It was uh, like, like Santa Claus was going to bring me presents, and I could, I could come. It was a sense of joy and excitement. It made me a better person. Number three, it made me a better person. Wow. So I knew that if I was a better person, Santa Claus was going to bring me presents. And if I didn't behave, if I was naughty and not nice, then Santa Claus was. So it gave me, a, it gave me joy. It was exciting. Somebody's still unmuted. It gave me joy. It gave me excitement. And it gave me a reason to be good. It was almost sacramental. It was a sacramental element to it. So actually every Christmas Eve, I would put milk and cookies out for Santa Claus to eat. And in the morning, lo and behold, I would wake up. I would wake up and oh my gosh, the cookies were, the cookies were eaten, the milk was gone. So it was like, it was like sacramental. It was something that was, it was like the visible become, the invisible becomes, becomes visible. It was amazing. It also gave me a sense of community because there were other people around me, other kids that were five and six years old that also believed in Santa Claus. And we shared this sacramental excitement of having Santa come to us. So it gave me, believing in Santa Claus gave me everything that people want in a religion. It gave me joy. It gave me an excitement, a reason for the season. It gave me a sense, it gave me a reason to be good. It was sacramental. And it gave me, it gave me community. It gave me everything that people say that they want in religion. But nonetheless, when I was about eight years old, I stopped believing in Santa. Why? Why on earth would I have stopped believing in something that gave me everything that people want in a belief system? The reason is because I found out that it wasn't true. I found out that it wasn't true that Santa Claus brings me presents on Christmas morning. So because it wasn't true, because it wasn't the truth, because it wasn't Veritas, I didn't want the joy anymore. It was a fake joy. I didn't want the excitement. It was a fake excitement. It was a, I didn't want that to be the reason why I was good, for example, because it was fake. More of all, mo most of all, I didn't want this kind of sense of, of community based around something that was, was false. Without truth, everything was fake. So I stopped believing in Santa Claus. This is the key. If we seek truth in our lives, 
and truth above all things, what is true. The secret is this, we actually get real joy thrown in. We get real goodness thrown in. We get a real reason to be good thrown in. And most of all, we get real community thrown into the picture. Seeking truth, veritas, is like one-stop shopping. It's the ultimate one-stop shopping. It's everything that people want in a belief system, but it's real. It's real. It's not fake. So what is it about truth then, veritas, that is so important? Why is it that veritas actually establishes real communities? Why is it that Veritas actually gives us a real reason to be good? Let's meditate on that for a little bit. I would like to start by saying there's three reasons why truth is so important. Three, three reasons. First of all, this is kind of the most, uh, the, most, the most important. Truth is our greatest protection against the evil one. The evil one. Okay. Two, truth is union with the real world as it is. And three, truth establishes union with others. Truth can properly establish union with others. And then this, this final point of establishing union with others is what's going to lead us into a meditation on living truth in our daily life, living veritas. All right. All right, first of all, the first one, truth is our greatest weapon against the tactics of the evil one. Why? God created men and women with dominion over creation. We can read this in the book of Genesis. God gave our first parents, Adam and Eve, man and woman, dominion over creation, a share in his own governance and dominion. Now, that means the whole created world was given over to Adam and Eve. They were the high priests of creation. Thus, when Adam sinned, he forfeited that dominion to the one who he then obeyed, that is, the devil. When Adam and Eve sinned, they forfeited a share of their dominion over to the one who became their master, who was the devil. Thus, the devil is called in the scriptures the prince of this world. He's called the prince of this world because through Adam's sin, the devil has a certain authority. Yet, Jesus Christ won the victory over the devil. By Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, he eternally, eternally bought back from the devil all the power that the devil once stole from our first parents. The evil one has no power. Jesus Christ's death on the cross destroyed his reign and destroyed any right that he might have to rule over the world. So right now, what is the devil's only tactic? What is the devil's only modus operandi of attacking men and women now? Because he knows he has no power. The only thing he can do is deceive. He is a deceiver because he has no right to authority over you, over myself, over anything in the material world. Jesus Christ has won it back. The only thing he can do is deceive us into thinking that he does by lying. Thus, truth by its nature immediately untangles and undoes the power of the evil one. The evil one's power is a power to deceive. That's it. He can do nothing, nothing else. He has no other power. Truth is the antidote. The evil one can, can, can forfeit. The evil one can simulate virtually everything else. The evil one can simulate excitement. The evil one can simulate or, or ape or, or parrot some kind of a false community. The evil one can even pretend to be virtuous in a kind of similitude. But the evil one cannot speak the truth. 
He cannot. Thus, when we learn to be speakers of truth, lovers of truth and then speakers of truth, we are completely disarming the evil one of the power that he has over us. Most of all, when we learn to be hearers of the truth and learn to discern the truth, discern the voice of he, him who is truth in all things, and then speak the truth, we are disarming the evil one. Two, truth connects us with the world, a real connection with reality. Real quick, two notions, two notions of the truth. There's a truth in things, and then there's a truth in the mind. For example, yeah. for example, when I see this white mug, white coffee mug, I can say this is a white coffee mug, and then I can have in my mind an image or a likeness of this white coffee mug. Truth in my mind is precisely my mind's conformity to the reality of this mug. When my mind conforms to this mug as the mug truly is in itself, there is truth, there's the relation of truth, and truth establishes that relation between my mind and the things that I know. Truth is not something that happens as a result of my mind's connection to the real world. Truth is my mind's connection with the real world. Truth is my mind's connection to the real world because truth is just the name that we give my mind having an accurate representation of the world as it is, not as it is not. That's truth in my mind, but you'll notice for the astute listener, and I know you guys are astute listeners, I've been using the word true in two different ways. I say that Truth exists in my mind if my mind conforms to this mug the way it really is, or in other words, the way it truly is. So how can I say, how can I use the word truth twice? What does it mean for the mug to be what it, quote, truly is? There's another mind at work in this equation. Truth exists in my mind because my mind is conformed to this mug. But truth exists in this mug when this mug is conformed to the mind of God who created it. That's another relation between the mind of God and this mug that establishes truth. In my mind. Not in the mind of God, but in this mug. And again, I will ask a few people if they could mute, if they could, because I'm still getting some feedback. If they could simply mute their screens or mute their microphones, it'd be really helpful. John, you're you are able to mute people too. Um, yeah. In case there's anybody struggling with it. All right, so now we're getting that straight. Now, but let's take this one step further. I, I said that my mind. My mind experiences, or as I say, there is truth in my mind when my mind conforms to this mug. But there is not truth in God's mind. Hey, hey John, we 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 uh, muted Brad, Father Brad. <laughs> Am I unmuted now? Yeah. Did I mute myself? I don't think so. I'm telling you, this is the evil one. The evil one is attacking our, our technology. All right. How long was I muted? Like two seconds, maybe. Oh, Three man. Seconds. Maybe that was me. Just happened. Okay. Maybe I, maybe I, I did that accidentally. I don't think I did. Oh. All right. 
Truth exists in this mug when this mug conforms to the mind of God. Truth exists in my mind when my, my mind conforms to this mug. Thus, when I know the truth about the world, what mind am I conforming to? The mind of God. To know the world, e.g. this mug, the way that it truly is, is nothing less than to unite my mind with the truth in God's mind as the creator of this mug. Truth is a union between my mind and the world, and because it's a union between myself and the world, it is as a result, a union between myself and God. To embrace falsehood, then, to embrace falsehood is not just to separate myself from the world. That is, to have an idea of the world the way that it is not. It is ultimately to separate my mind and myself from God. Truth is then a unifying force. By its nature, truth unifies. When I know truth, I am unified with those things that I know, and then ultimately unified with God, who is the source of all being and truth. When our minds are in conformity with things the way they really are, our minds are then in union with God and in union with his creation. Let's take us a step further. This is why veritas, or truth, is the only proper locus or center around which we can form a real human community. This is an important, this is an important topic. This is an important reality. Veritas, or truth, is the only locus or center around which human beings can truly come together in a true unity, because only truth is a unifying force. If human beings come together around a falsehood, it's not a true unity. It's a similitude of unity. It's a kind of fake unity. It's not real communion. And especially when Christians come together in union around our faith in God, veritas and the unifying power of veritas becomes all the more important. This is why we can go to number three, the third aspect of truth I was talking about. Truth connects us with others. Truth connects us with other people. Okay. Why is it that truth, by its very nature, even if I'm studying truth by myself in my room, or if I'm reading, reading a book of philosophy and theology, even if I'm studying by myself, if I'm studying what is true, I am by that very nature being connected with other people. Why? Truth is fundamentally a common good. It is a common good. You can write this down if you know what you're taking. Truth is a, quote, common good. It means it's not an individual good. Truth is never an individual good. It's impossible. It's impossible. Why? Again, I'm going to use the example of my trusty mug. It's been a good example before. It'll be a good example now. I have a delicious beverage in my mug. I take a sip of this delicious beverage. The sip, the sip of liquid that I take is precisely not the sip of liquid that you can take. Every time I take a sip, of my beverage, there's less beverage in here for you. There's not more. What is more, I could actually drink this entire beverage and I could exhaust the beverage and then you couldn't have any at all. This is why this beverage, even if we share it, this beverage is never a common good. It's always an individual good. This is important. Even if we share this beverage, this cup, it's actually decaf coffee if you want to know. Even if we share this decaf coffee, this coffee will always be an individual good because it's precisely unshareable. The coffee I drink is not the coffee you drink. The oxygen I breathe 
the oxygen I breathe is fundamentally not the same oxygen that you breathe at the same time and in the same space. Oxygen is always an individual good. It's a material good. But truth is different. Truth is not a material good, and truth is not an individual good. It is by nature a common good precisely because it can be shared without diminution. It can be shared without losing any of its truth. I can drink this beverage and it's gone. But I can't know truth so much that I exhaust truth so it's gone. If I share truth with you, that's not truth that I lose. No, it's truth that I share. Truth is fundamentally a shareable reality because when I share it, I don't diminish truth. I only expand it. And no matter how many people in our circle or in the world might know the truth that I know, I don't know it any less. I actually know it more the more I give it away. This is because truth is fundamentally a common good. So truth and truth alone is a locus around which people can truly come together in a shared reality. Oftentimes in the modern world, we hear a phrase. I hear this phrase floating around there all the time. It drives me crazy. Well, I have my truth, but you have your truth. We've all heard this. Now, we've all heard this, and in a certain sense, everybody instinctually, certainly if a good, every good Dominican kind of instinctually knows that this is nonsense. There's no such thing as my truth. That's nonsense. There's just the truth. Why? Because the truth is fundamentally a common good. Now, I can speak of my sip of coffee. That's possible because the, co the coffee that I sip is not the coffee that you sip. But I can't speak about my truth. There's no such thing. Truth is by nature common. Thus, when we speak truth as Dominicans, this is important, when we speak truth and we develop the habit of truth and learning how to speak the truth, we are fundamentally sharing community in communion with others. It's one of the greatest acts of charity you can give to your brothers and sisters is to simply tell them the truth. To tell them the truth, because that is a true locus of unity. If you try to tell them something simply to flatter them, but it's not the truth, there's a wall between you and them. You're separating yourself from them. If you try some, to tell somebody something that you think they want to hear to feel better, but you're not telling them the truth, you've severed a unity with that person. You're not as united with that person as you could be if you spoke the truth. Truth unites us with others because truth is fundamentally a common good. Okay. How does this change how we speak in the world and how we, how we actually live veritas in the real world? Well, one of our mottos in the Dominican order is, as we said, veritas. But the Dominican order is one of those weird orders that has like a lot of different mottos because we can't make up our minds. Another motto that we have is, is laudare, benedicere, predicare. To praise, to bless, and to preach. To praise, to bless, and to preach. Now, if you think about it, to praise, to bless, and to preach are all kind of activities associated with speaking the truth. Laudare, to praise. We praise God. And of course, we praise God in truth. Because truth, when we speak truth, it is a type of praising of God. When we speak truth, all who hear us are being united to God through their uniting to the universe and to us and to the world. When we speak truth, it is always a praise of God. Laudare. Benedicere. Benedicere. Actually, even in the word itself, benedicere. You have dicere, to speak. Let us speak. Bene, 
is to speak well. To bless, which is benedicere, is nothing other than to speak well. When we speak well, we are blessing because we're speaking the truth. Because we're speaking the truth. Finally, predicare. Benedicere, then predicare, to preach. Pray is just before, then you have the same, you have the same look. Pray dicare, like benedicere, pray dicare, to speak the truth. What are ways that we can fail to speak the truth in the modern world? I think in the modern world, Saint, well, the modern world is, is, is in a larger sense no, no different than the world as it has always been, as it has always been. There are, there are, St. Thomas, St. Thomas Aquinas outlines three ways that we can sin against the virtue of truth or speaking the truth. There are three types of lying, basically. You can write this down if you want. There's the malicious lie. There's the jocose lie. And there is the officious lie. The malicious lie is when you're saying something with your mouth, using words to directly deceive another person. So that the words that you speak, the words that leave your mouth, instead of being a representation of the ideas in your mind, are actually not. They're designed to deceive. They're designed to give your hearer an image in his mind, his or her mind, that is not in yours. So lying always creates disunity. Lying always dis, you know, disunites people. But also, there is the officious lie. The officious lie is a lie that when we try to tell somebody something that is not true, but it's not directly contrary to charity, we tell them something that is not necessarily true because we are trying, we are trying to seek their good in some way. It's officious, mean, officious lie, meaning that, meaning, meaning that we're trying to accomplish some good for the person. This is oftentimes seen when parents Parents tell their children half-truths because they know that their children are not prepared or adult yet or mature enough to accept or understand the full truth of the world. Parents tell their children things, you know, maybe half-truths or, you know, perhaps, perhaps no truths at all simply because they, they know that their children are not in a position yet that they can even understand or, let's say, let's say process the full reality of the world that they someday will. Now, St. Thomas would insist that this is still technically it's an act of lying because you're, you, you're, you're having words leave your mouth with the intent to deceive another, but it's not contrary to charity, he insists. This is not contrary to charity. And why is this not contrary to charity? Because if the, per, the person speaking is desiring the good of the other. But let's say the third lie, something I want to focus on, the jocose lie. Lying for the sense of irony, boasting, or humor. This can be dangerous. This can be dangerous. Lying for the sense of boasting, irony, or humor. Oftentimes, as in boasting, we can use words, we can use human speech, in order to portray ourselves in a way that's not true, but in a way that we think will accomplish in the world a state of affairs that is more fitting for us. Let's say we we boast we boast of our boast of ourselves simply so our friends and neighbors will think more highly of us than we actually are. This is of course a lie. Sarcasm is a great misuse of human speech, boasting in the form of sarcasm, using irony in the form of sarcasm, is a great misuse of human speech. It's a use of human speech that's not intended to convey truth or actually convey what's in the mind, but it's a use of speech that's designed to cut another person down. It's the opposite of benedicere. It's the opposite of benedicere. So often, I believe we sin 
we sin more with our speech than we are aware of, <laughs> particularly with sarcasm, cutting up others down using the gift of human speech and the gift of, of the capacity to tell truth. Exaggeration. This is a big one. We can oftentimes sin through boasting and irony, and irony is the opposite of boasting for St. Thomas. Irony is just not speaking too highly of ourselves, but speaking less of ourselves than we actually are. Oh, I'm so horrible. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm the worst. I'm the scum of the earth, yada, yada. Christians are in Olympic condition at this. Christians are in Olympic. It's like a race to the bottom sometimes when you hear Christians talk about how humble they are. It's just ridiculous. But uh, this is irony. The, 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 it's, it's, it's still, it's, you're lying. It's a type of lying, but it's a type of irony. But uh, the use of exaggeration, we're talking about. oftentimes we get ourselves caught in storytelling and telling stories about the past, telling stories about our family, telling stories about heroes. And then we catch ourselves inadvertently, almost catch ourselves off guard, exaggerating about the facts. Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. So we're going to exaggerate about the facts. Why? Not because it's the truth, but because we want to entertain with a good story to tell. It's the use of human speech, which is not to convey truth, but the use of human speech to merely excite, to merely arouse the passions or to say arrest attention from other people. It's not a valid use of human speech. It's not a valid use of the capacity to speak truth, to benedicere, to predicare. We as Dominicans are called to be speakers of the truth. And because we're speakers of the truth, we, I do believe this is, I'm not just, I'm not just sounding, I don't just want to puff up the Dominican order. Well, I, I do, but I don't, I don't want to sound arrogant. But we as Dominicans are in a unique position to unwind the tactics of the evil one. Because we can speak the truth and speak the truth in love. And because we Dominicans have a special calling to speak the truth, laudare, benedicere, predicare, the evil one attacks us right here. This is exactly where the evil one attacks us. And we are tempted more than, uh, more than most, I think, we are tempted to sarcasm. We are tempted to passionate speech, which does not convey truth. We are tempted to cursing in passion, cursing speech, which is not, not intended at all to convey truth. It's just intended to kind of vent, vent my feelings or to kind of inflict something on others through the use of human speech, which is a horrible sin. We are tempted more than any, I think, to exaggeration. And also, I think as Dominicans, we are uniquely tempted toward even sins of flattery. Flattering others, not because we're speaking truth, but because we're trying to get others to simply like us or trying to get others to think that we are relevant. And all these are corruptions of human speech. They're corruptions of the capacity to speak truth. And friends, it's one of my final warnings to you fellow Dominicans. The more we habituate ourselves, the more we habituate ourselves to not speaking truth, let's say lying or to exaggerate or, or, or exaggerating, or being sarcastic, the less we're able to actually perceive truth. Our Lord says that to those who can be trusted with a little, more will be given. When we fall into sins of lying, sins of exaggeration, sins of flattery, sins of boasting, sins of exaggeration, we are taking the truth that God has given us and we're not being responsible with it. We're not speaking it. And like clockwork, like clockwork, the more and more we habituate ourselves to lying, even the little white lies, we lose our sensitivity to what is real. We lose our sensitivity to what's really there. Sometimes the more we exaggerate about ourselves, the more we boast about ourselves and puff ourselves up, we actually lose a proper awareness of ourselves. And we lose the ability to even make a good examination of conscience because 
We're so disconnected from the world around us that we're disconnected from ourselves. And we're disconnected because we have not loved, first and foremost, that single unifying principle of veritas. Veritas, the principle that can unite us to the world, that can unite us to God, our creator, and finally unite us to others. That's the importance of veritas in the world. And I think that's the important, importance of our call as Dominicans. Veritas is at the center. And then we go out with love of veritas in laudare, you know, praising God with the truth. Benedicere, blessing others. Predicare, preaching the truth. And in preaching the truth, bringing the world to him who is truth and saving the world. Amen? Amen. Let me quick end with a quick prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I'd like to ask you to manifest your victory over all falsehood, over all deception and evil as we offer the words that you gave us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from it. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All right, you guys, thank you. I will, you know, if you guys have any questions, I'll be willing to, to take some questions. Uh, we, we have a couple that's from online real quick um, that kind of gathered while we while you were talking, just a few. Um, the Mike asked, um, was truth an antidote to the power of the devil in 700 BC? <laughs> yes, yes. He's the deceiver. And our Lord Jesus says that he was a deceiver from the beginning. He was a deceiver from the beginning. So, so yes, and this, is, this is what, this is ultimately why um, the spirit of truth, the spirit of truth, uh, 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 the Holy Spirit, God, the third person of the Trinity, we, we say in the creed, he has spoken through the prophets, because this is prophecy. This is what the prophets were doing. They were speaking. The prophets were for telling the future. It's kind of colloquially, we use the word prophecy to somebody tells the future. But primarily, the prophets were prophets because they spoke the truth of God with the power of God, through the spirit of God. This is what makes, this is what made a prophet a prophet. So Isaiah, for example, in 700 BC was a prophet because he spoke the truth of God uh, and because the evil one, the evil one knew, the evil one knew that God was undoing his power. What was the other questions? Uh, the other one is, um, where does satire fall into this example? I think what you were talking about the- Interesting, uh, satire can be a, kind, of, kind of like humor, like a jocose, a jocose type of humor. Um, yeah, St. Saint, Saint Thomas is really, is really dark on, on even, even lying, lying for the sake of humor, lying for the sake of humor. When it's done, it's not necessarily, it's when, it, when it's done, if, if you're lying for the sake of humor, Still, this human act, the human act that you're engaging in is a human act of, of putting words on your mouth that are not in your mind, but you're doing it for the purpose, not to deceive, but for the purpose of humor. So this is why St. Thomas would say this is not directly contrary to charity, even though the human act is an act of, of, of lying, like, a, like, let's say, humor for the, like, exaggeration for the sense of humor. Uh, exaggeration for the sake of humor or irony for the sake of humor or satire for the sake of humor. Uh, but those people who do engage in humor, like comedians, for example, and make a life of writing comedy, they have to be very careful. They have to be very, very careful because, and I've seen this with comedians. I've seen this with comedy writers, actually. They've even said this about themselves. Even secular comedy writers have said this about themselves. The more and more they get into it, they actually lose a connection to see the real world the way it actually is. They start seeing the world and all these, they, they, they actually, um, they can't stop seeing the world in a sarcastic way. Yeah, and so, so not, not that humor is directly contrary to charity, because it's not. Humor is not something that directly contra is, it con contradicts the uh, a charitable intent, but it is, uh, it's, it, humor can be a slippery slope if we're not careful. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I suppose so others put theirs in. I'll just read them and listen. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, just read the question. If you want to read it or I can read it for you. 
Oh, I mean, yeah, just read it. Uh, yeah. Uh, what about when two people see the same thing differently? Remember the dress that was seen as black and blue or gold, white and gold? Um, I, I do have a friend who insists that this it's related that um, that there can be two things can be true and like two contradictory, which I struggle with talking with her. I think it's related to, to her comment. Yeah, and I think this is just a quotation of two different things. We're talking about two different things here. Let's say, let's say like so for, for if somebody's colorblind, <laughs> somebody's colorblind, somebody sees a blue dress and it actually looks to them like it's black because they can't see the color blue, you know? So their truth is that it's a, it's a black dress. And the other person's truth is that it's a blue dress. The truth is, no, the dress has a color. This is a, this is a, this is a faulty perception. So there can be, two people can have two different perceptions, but that's different than truth. That's just sensory perception. That's different. That's just, that's, that's distinct. So the fact that one person is colorblind and sees the dress as black is itself a truth that both can share. And even if a, uh, they're remembering two things differently? Yeah, human, human memory is a sense. Human memory is not necessarily true. Uh, human memory, human memory, memory is an internal sense. So even animals have memory, even irrational animals have memory, something like memory. So uh, people can remember things in different ways. This does not mean that they were all automatically two different events. It means that one person's perception in their memory is faulty. It doesn't change reality. Our memories don't create reality. Our memory, our memory is a tool that can connect us to reality, but memory is a faulty tool. It's faulty. Mm. It's just as faulty as a person's sense of smell or sense of sight that goes bad with age. Mm. Memory is a sense, just like, a, just like the five physical senses. Memory can go, memory can go bad with age. You know, so just because just because a person that's colorblind can't see color does not automatically mean that the world in truth is not colored. So these are these are this these are all differences of perception, not 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 a multiplication of truth. Mm, I see. Uh, and then um, Mike asked about. Um, the, the bi biography of St. Benedict, um, it's, it's said that, that Gregory the Groat wrote about Den Benedict and the, um, it was said that his work was hagiography. H I'm Hagi the, hagiography. Yeah, yeah. So he's, uh, so he's saying, does that mean it was an exaggeration and was it sinful? <laughs> my, it might, it might, I don't know. I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that question because I don't know what to the, what degree uh, Gregory might have exaggerated or or to what degree he even knew that he was exaggerated. I don't know. I mean, we don't know this. I, 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 I can't jump into the mind of, of Gregory and, and figure that out. Hagiogra hagiography, um, hagiography has a place in spirituality, I think. It does, but we have to be careful about it. So we have to be careful not to, to this, is, this is why I think critical biographies of the saints are very important. You know, to to dust off from the saints a lot of the hagiographic plaque that the the images of the saints develop over time. Um, this is one of the reasons why I really appreciate the fact that Saint Dominic was never very popular. He was certainly not as popular as Saint Francis. And so, because Saint Francis was so popular, you have all of these versions of Saint Francis that are like not even they're like not even really human. You know, but Saint Dominic it never happened to Saint Dominic. So Saint Dominic, because he he was never very popular. In the popular, you know, popular piety world, um, you never have this this kind of pious plaque that just develops around his image that can oftentimes distort the image, you know. So, but it's important for our spirituality. It's important for our spirituality that if we know, like that we that we should know as much as we can about the saints because the saints are there for our imitation, and our and our and our our admiration. And we can we can imitate their lives to, to the degree that we can. You know, we'll never imitate all the saints perfectly. But uh, yeah, good questions. Uh, Mike, Mike had another question. Mike, you got lots of questions today. Mike. I don't know. If... 
if he else does. Yeah, Mike, you're doing. Yeah. Is there a difference between what a liar does and what a man, madman does when they say that they have seen a Martian? Intention. Is the madman also lying? Intention. 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 Yeah. Intention. Intention. The, the madman, by virtue of being a madman, is the man who has lost the ability to form a proper moral intention. Hmm. This is why. This is why if a madman does, if a, if a person who's truly a madman commits a crime, he's guilty of the crime. But he's not as guilty as he would have been if he was, if he had the capacity to form a real intention. Mm -hmm. You know, so the madman who has lost the use of reason is properly speaking, not engaging in a speech act at all. He's not engaging in a true human speech act. Even if materially he's saying the same things as somebody in their right mind, he's not engaging in a, a true human speech act because his speech is coming from instinct. His, his speech is coming from animal impulse, his passions. They're not coming from the use of his reason because by virtue of being a madman, he's lost his reason. Mm. And if he, did, if he still had use of his reason, then he wouldn't be a madman. Okay. Does, does that help you? I hope. So I, I think I, I know we're running low on, or we've gone well over our time, but I, you know, when you were talking about, um, about losing our sensitivity to, to the truth and losing our proper self sense of self, when we engage in these different types of lying, even sarcasm and, and these things. So how do we come back from that? Like, is it, how do we, um, I, I know personally speaking with my speech gets me in the most trouble, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, I, I'm not alone in that, which is why I feel brave enough to say it on something like this, but like, um, how do we purify our speech and how do we come back from, from being um, in, in cultures where that's so common? Good questions. Um, well, first of all, if, if you if you, you have been given the grace to realize that you're a person that falls into lying a lot, white lying, a lot of little tiny white lies, little tiny lies of exaggeration. First of all, you do it, what, it, what you, we always do if we catch ourselves. If the Holy Spirit has given us this purity, we repent, 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 and then uh, live a life of truth. Live a life of truth. I think that we greatly underestimate the power of little white lies. When we fall into little white lies, these are actually big. They're actually big because they're small. They're really bad because they're small, because we, there's, we, there's little white lies that we just say to people just to get at, just so we don't have to confront them or just to, to make sure that they just don't pay attention to us or whatever, whatever. The little white lies, especially in family, those little white lies we tell each other, those things can become very dangerous because they can habituate us to using language as a means of manipulating other people. This is why this is so dangerous because we slowly turn into people we don't want to be because of these little tiny white lies. Um, nobody ever died of a heart attack because they had one meal where they just ate a big bucket of lard. You know. Nobody died of a heart attack because of one episode of eating a big bucket of lard. It doesn't work that way. First of all, if you tried to eat a big bucket of lard, your body would immediately reject it. You would probably throw up. You know, your body would get sick, right? And you would never do that again. Okay, nobody becomes a habitual liar because of one major lie. No. If anything, the one may, if, if you get caught in a major lie, you're going to know it just like your body rejects it. You're going to repent. And so the evil one doesn't get us there. That's not, that's not the tactic of the evil one. The evil one gets us to fall into those hundreds of thousands of little tiny white lies throughout the day that we don't even, we're not even aware of. Just like the person that actually dies of a heart attack, not because of the bucket of law, no, because of decades and decades of a little bit more eating than he should have, right? That's when somebody dies of a heart attack because of a lifetime of little bad choices. People lose their souls. Friends, listen to me. People lose their souls in the end, not because of some major one big huge sin, 
People lose their souls because of decades and decades of little tiny white lies. So they're really big because they're little. And people need to be like really be, be cautious of this. Um, yeah, that's my two cents. Yeah. Anthony, do you? Hi, Father. Uh, hey, it's Anthony. Anthony, what's up? Hey, uh, great listening to you. I have a question. Um, this is uh, something that comes up in films a lot of times, especially like sci-fi movies, but I, I think you'll have an opinion on this. I, I'm eager to hear it. So you know how uh, when all the world seems to believe a lie is actually true, kind of like Plato's cave, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's only one person that seems to know the truth, like Morpheus in The Matrix or, uh, or Rorschach in The Watchmen something like that. Uh, and all of the, uh, the world seems to be at peace, all based on this lie. And they know that if they speak the truth, it will ruin the peace of the world. Is it, or how do you navigate that? You mean, <laughs> do, do, instead of using the example of like, matrix or something just like the the example of the example of like any, anybody who would think if speaking the truth can actually cause harm to somebody yeah basically i, I suppose yeah. but it's it's more catastrophic though of course and yes yeah. you know, so yeah this is the, for the, for example you are not as a human being always responsible you, you it might not be your responsibility to tell everybody everything especially especially if stuff is not your your business this is an important thing. Oftentimes, people fall into people fall into uh, great, great, uh, you know, violations of charity simply because they're telling people things that ought not to be be said, right? Um, if 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 we're the holders of a secret, for example, if we have if we have secret information on somebody that does not need to be spoken of, that could be a great sin of detraction if we speak it. So just because we are people called to speak truth does not mean that in every single situation we are obligated to speak everything. It doesn't mean that. It means we have to be prudent in our use of speech. We have to be prudent in the truth that we do speak, knowing that the, the, the measure by which we will be judged is the measure of charity, is the measure of charity. So every time we do speak a truth in the world, we are doing so with the intent to bring other people closer to God in charity. And any time we refrain from speaking, any time we refrain from speaking, we do so with the same intention, is to help them. Because sometimes speaking something would actually hurt another person. So we don't want to say that. unless it's something that absolutely has to be said. This is where prudence comes in, prudence. It would be the virtue of prudence, which is an essential virtue. So, listen, you guys, it's already yeah. at the yeah. hour. It's already yeah. the hour. Yeah, yeah we're done. And um, Father, I have a couple things. One, I really greatly thank you for your time. Absolutely. And you obviously, committed some work and homework on this and put it together unless it all flows from your head, which is quite impressive. A um, couple notes. Uh, one is that Benedict XVI mentioned in his book with Cardinal Sarah last year, which addresses some of what you talked about from the depths of our hearts. He says in the introduction, although ideology divides, truth unites hearts. Amen. And so that just emphasizes what what you were talking about. The other thing is I want to make sure um, people know that this uh, Zoom will be posted on the St. Margaret of Castello chapter channel on YouTube. So shortly after this, and I just want to thank everybody who's participated. And Father, really good to see you. Um, yeah, you guys too. You guys too. And look forward to talking to you too again. We'd like to have you on. We have kind of a local podcast we'd like to contact you about and talk about some more of this stuff. And Absolutely. Po post it on our web. But anyway, um, do you have any final word or anything? Um, 
no, guys, thank you very much. Keep me in your prayers as well. So you're in my prayers and, and pray for me for my perseverance. Thank you. Will do. And if you could give a final blessing, that'd be great. Absolutely. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Michael the Archangel, St. Margaret of Castello, and all the Dominican saints. The Dicat Bos, Omnipotence Deus, Pater, et Filius, et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Take care. Right. Bye bye. Thank you, Pamela. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> really appreciate it. Well, good work on this. Father did the work. <laughs> uh, it's good. <laughs>